So let us ask you a question. Are you afraid of the dark? Because I'm totally not at all afraid of the dark. I never have been. That's just a fact about me. What are you talking about? Is this a joke or what? It's also a lie. I am afraid of the dark, and I'm also afraid of faceless people, which I'm not alone in because it happened to thousands of other kids in the 90s who were either fortunate or unfortunate enough to catch one of Nickelodeon's breakout shows that also scared the daylights out of its audience. As the weather turns chilly and your coworkers start to like push their excess candy corn upon you, let's take a spooky look at Are You Afraid of the Dark? <laughs> We have to imagine that it was pitched to a room of executives as a horror anthology series that's like Tales from the Crypt, but, you know, for kids. But was it for kids? Just look at that intro. Because I won't, it's too scary. You look at it. <laughs> That's the first 30 seconds, and I already have goosebumps. Not those goosebumps, but not not those goosebumps. Though Are You Afraid of the Dark did share a lot in common with the R.L. Stein adapted TV show called Goosebumps that aired on Fox Kids in the late 90s. For example, like Drake, they're both Canadian born. Due to the low cost of the Canadian dollar, it made financial sense for networks to buy programming internationally and import it to the States. Both Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps appeared on Canada's YTV and even shared much of the same cast of actors and actresses. There's just less people in Canada. Even a young local actor named Hayden Christensen when he played what else but a gnarly 90s snowboarder. And he was just as emotionless then, sorry. Episodes would start around a campfire in the woods where a group of teenage friends known as the Midnight Society, which sounds more like a group of hackers, would tell scary stories. Viewers would then watch those stories unfold or, let's be honest, semi-watch through fingers covering their eyes because... <laughs> Episodes would run the gamut of typical horror fare. There were blood-curdling monsters like this girl that the ring totally ripped off. Help! Someone let me out! Help! Leave me alone! I agree, leave me alone. Oof. Next, there's this pool guy. I will take that image to my grave. Then there's the living doll. No, hard pass on all living dolls all the time. And finally, there's fan favorite Zebo the Clown. In one of the series' most iconic episodes, Zebo the Clown torments a teenager who stole his nose from a funhouse. And frankly, the kid deserved it. That's circus property, punk, and very rude to steal a nose. Also, what kind of dummy would mess with this clown? <laughs> what do you think I am, some kind of clown? Naturally, Zebo stalks his dum dum in appropriately horrifying fashion. Yes, anything you want, Mr. Zebo, sir. I will not mess with you. Also, here's my um, social security number and my pin code, and also my Amazon Prime password, and anything else that you want for my life. And that's just an average run of the mill story you might hear from the Midnight Society. These kids had a warped sense of fun. Lighten up, get a Tamagotchi, go make trouble. The kids at the campfire would each take turns telling stories and then toss midnight dust, which definitely sounds like something you'd vape, into the fire. Midnight dust is actually just non dairy creamer, which doesn't sound as cool, so forget I said that. Their catchphrase was, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, which was a touching tribute to Rod Serling. It's a fitting allusion to the show that directly inspired the show's creators, DJ McHale and Ned Kandel. McHale graduated from NYU Film School, but had trouble breaking into writing for primetime TV. When he met his producing partner, Ned Kandel, they teamed up to produce kids' content, starting with after-school specials, Encyclopedia Brown, and Criss Cross. Criss Cross will make you go, go. Not the kid rapper. Eventually, they developed their own show, which was initially a much tamer rendition of Are You Afraid of the Dark, called Scary Tales, that saw lazy parents telling their kids bedtime stories. Nobody bought that pitch. Then Mikhail realized that the stories he loved as a kid were actually scary ones. And as Mikhail put it, it would be creepy to have some old guy telling scary stories to little kids. So the old time actor goes away and is replaced with kids sitting around the campfire. Though kids with no parents sitting alone in the woods talking about Zebo the Clown seems creepier, objectively, Nickelodeon rebuffed them at first as the network was rightfully wary of scaring children and future sci-fi hosts for life. But after they left behind a three-page pitch treatment, and when Nickelodeon brought in a new executive named Jay Mulvaney, he dug up the old material, helped retool the premise, and greenlit a pilot, which is how we got this. You might say, I sort of died! <laughs> 
The pilot aired in 1990 on Halloween night, and the show went to series a full year later in 1991. At first, Nickelodeon was nervous about upsetting parents, and one has to wonder why. So they had the creators base many of the episodes on pre-existing scary stories from classic literature. This way, when parents got upset, they could defend themselves by pointing out that the idea had actually already been done by Edgar Allan Poe. And who could get mad at a mug like that? With the concept locked, all they had to do was get the title right. Scary Tales was too generic, so McHale did what we all do when we need inspiration. He read Dr. Seuss. He said of the title, there was a scary story written by Dr. Seuss called, What Was I Scared Of? So I took that title and thought, well, I was afraid of clowns and I was afraid of the dark. And that's where the title came from. So you can thank Dr. Seuss for those nightmares now. Now all they needed was a cast of teens who could scream believably, which is easy when you're staring down the ghastly grinner. Ah! Bang on windows frantically. <laughs> do whatever this is and pull off lines like this. We are not toys, lady. Okay, bad example, that's not fair. But the producers needed a cast that could carry complex emotional arcs and build tension. And since it was an anthology show, that meant a whole new cast of kid actors for every episode of every season. The casting process was arduous, requiring producers to scour North America. Eventually, Mikhail saw so many children audition that he got chicken pox. Ooh, kids are gross. Is that justice for my nightmares? Arguably, yes. But all that work paid off as they put together a spectacular cast that would see many of its actors grow up to rise through the ranks of Hollywood's elite. There was Hayden Christensen, of course, but also screams Nev Campbell. Ah! Man, she must really get tired of pretending to be scared. Jay Baruchel, who somehow had a deeper voice back then. How are we gonna top that one exactly? Alicia Cuthbert, and of course, the one you've all been waiting for, the one, the only, Gilbert Gottfried. Uh, excuse me, no cutting in line. Just kidding, it's Ryan Gosling. No! Even the camera knows he's gonna be famous. I mean, look at all those close-ups. Gosling actually turned down an offer as a full-fledged member of the Midnight Society in favor of the Mickey Mouse Club, though they might have been able to land him if the show wrote in more musical numbers. Pull a monster the musical, why not? Are You Afraid of the Dark would see its best episodes run in the first five seasons before the show went on hiatus and recast all but one member of the Midnight Society since they all got too old to reprise their roles. In fact, the series finale was intended to be season five's The Tale of the Night Shift, which saw a shape-shifting zombie infiltrate a hospital and feed off its victims. Also, it gave viewers one of the most frightening scares of the entire series. That's why I hate hospitals. Yep. Shape-shifting zombies, I assume they're real now. That was the only episode where the campfire wasn't put out at the end. But fear not, for the fire still raged. After a two year hiatus, the show came back. But the best stuff came early on, like in the season three episode, The Tale of the Dream Girl, which actually inspired M. Night Shyamalan to make The Sixth Sense. Though, which one inspired him to make The Happening? Will we ever know? Let's don't. The Dream Girl episode is a tender but creepy, emphasis on creepy, story of a boy named Johnny who is haunted by a ghostly woman who died a long time ago in a train accident with her boyfriend. Can you guess the twist? The aliens are allergic to water. No, the boyfriend is Johnny who's been dead the whole time. They're always dead the whole time. And that means I'm... While the series was heavy on tension, fans will also remember the lighter moments when the writers used comedy to alleviate the suspense or sometimes ramp it up, which explains Bobcat Goldwave. Sound familiar? However, what's not explained is who was lighting the campfire for the Midnight Society. Every episode would start with the fire already lit, which does suggest a pyromaniac roaming the woods, right? The real answer was that Nickelodeon was paranoid about showing children how to light a match. So for 91 episodes, nobody ever lights that fire. Children still don't know how to use matches to this day. Though they always put it out with a bucket of water. Smokey the Bear would be so proud. After 91 episodes, there was talk of making a feature film starring the second cast, but Nickelodeon canceled it after Mikhail refused to give the script a lighter tone, which would have robbed the show of everything that made it popular in the first place which included the gut-wrenching tension, the gotcha scares, but most of all the deeply intricate mysteries that intoxicated audiences. Like, how did the match light itself in the opening? If anybody knows, please feel free to mention it in the comments. No, seriously, I need a new party trick. Until then, I declare this bucket of water dumped and this meeting of the Midnight Society closed.